Special Issues, winner of the NCT Award for Technical and Scientific Communication, Best Article on Methods of Teaching, winner of the College on Conference Composition Committee's Computers and Composition 2009 Technical Innovation <coughs> Award, winner of the Computers and Composition, Composition Distinguished Book Award 2007 for uh, Digital Writing Research Edited with Heidi McKee, Winner of the Kairos Best Web Text Award 2006 Writing in Digital Environments Research Center Why Digital Tech Why Teach Digital Writing um, 18 peer reviewed book chapters 34 peer reviewed articles um, and the most punk rock scholar uh, please welcome Daniel.
in their different professions. We do a lot of client projects, a lot of experiential learning. It's the difference between I can do this to I have done this. We work on our portfolios often and we know that if it's not growing, it's not going to be competitive. We're going to take pretty much the rest of today to work on our portfolio. So as you're working, if you think of anything else that you want feedback on, let me know. They get to see not just some grid, but how is someone actually reacting to their work. Traditionally, the college internship is something you do at the end of your degree. We get our students to start thinking about internships as soon as they enter the major. I'm the user experience research intern. I'm an editorial assistant for MSU Press. I'm a social media intern at TechSmith. I am on my third internship. I'm the student managing editor at Recur. Um, my next internship was at Film and Television Production Company in New York City. Internships apply what we learn in the classroom to whatever jobs we may have in the future. Our students are working as staff writers and technical writers, web developers and information architects, editors, communication specialists, and lots of other things. I am a user experience researcher. I got a job at Cartoon Network. I do research for our company that can help evaluate the usability of our products and their design. Uh, we wear a lot of hats here at the museum, and definitely different parts of the PW program help me get to where I am today. Portfolio really helped me in my interview at Cartoon Network. Uh, the PW program makes you a Swiss Army knife for the workforce. <laughs> I can be a professional while still expressing my creativity. We're creating the kind of people who are going out into the world and not just doing good work, but being good people and doing work that, that makes the world a better place. All the advisors, all the professors, every single one will help you. It's a community, and you feel like you're actually involved in something important. I've seen two of the students' projects turned into small businesses. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, outcome. There's no way I could have done this on my own without PW. I felt like this major was written especially for me.
in uh, 2008, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education in my college and I launched a Longitudinal Technology Use and Experiences Survey when students came in um, declaring a major in arts and letters at our university orientation program. So <laughs> fill up this ridiculously long. Um, this is like page three of 12. Um, survey about their technology experiences. And then we surveyed them every year after that. So in the spring of 2011, um, we had regular meetings, and in the spring of 2011, we met with about 15 of them that were part of the survey. Um, and one of the students said, I will tell you, my technology skills is excellent. I came in from a great school, we did slideshows, I worked on um, the yearbook, I worked on the school newspaper, I worked on InDesign, I created web pages in my art classes. I've been writing essays for the last three years. And um, the associate dean and I looked at each other just aghast um, and thought, more innovative and strategic about how we're getting humanities students involved in technology use um, on campus. So we did a range of things. I'm gonna tell you about some of those things. Um, but this is framed by an argument around creativity, innovation, um, the digital, and entrepreneurship. So the first aspect here is the creative. If you've read Sir Ken Robinson, and I just realized I have a handout, you forgot to do that. Um, he has done some fantastic work on creativity. So there's two. They're the same color because it's fun to confuse everybody. Um, Sir Ken has noted on a um, handout uh, one of his claims to fame is creativity is as important as literacy and requires a place in all of our education endeavors. Uh, Lyndon Nyman runs a nonprofit consulting organization. Um, she says, your ideas, you don't have to know, you're imaginative, but not creative. I think an important distinction. And one of my friends, Carl Booth, created this to talk about creativity. And I love, love, love this diagram. So one of the things um, that this shows us and tells us that you can have knowledge and creativity, but nothing gets done there. Think about perhaps endless community meetings where people talk ideas to them. You've got the knowledge, you've got those people, but but as far as that. Creativity and stimulus can be generative, but you don't come up with much you can act on in the world because it's not grounded and founded in knowledge. You can have stimulus in knowledge, but you're not going to come up with anything particularly innovative. But that sweet spot is the middle here. When we have creativity, we have knowledge, and we have a stimulus. We have a method, a mode, an issue, a problem that we play with. And this is uh, one of the ways that Carl integrates this in his classroom. He teaches a 500 student lecture on creativity. something together from the bathroom, something together from the kitchen. So it's two things that really don't go together, cram together, to try and make a fun game. And it's, it's a step toward the creative process, toward collaboration, toward making up something that's never existed before. The important thing is that they're going to now go on to bigger and more important collaborations. But this shows them that, that something that they invent out of their heads can actually, actually has a real world implication. Of creativity, 
Um, what is the stereotype that we have to work to rupture all the time that, that people who are creatives, and they are creatives, that is, you know, a noun, um, that everyone has creative capacity, and it's uh, an issue of um, uh, providing tools and measures and means and reasons, the stimulus, the knowledge, to act on it. Um, and the other thing has to do with creativity to scale, that you can take people and put them in a field. We're a school of 50,000, you guys are 60, 63,000, um, that you can scale these sorts of initiatives. Um, at home, in my College of Arts and Letters, um, right after the dean and I had that conversation with the student who said, look, my technology skills have backslid, um, we launched uh, a space, I mentioned it, the Creativity Exploratory. This is the students talking about this space. The Creativity Exploratory is located on the third floor of Linton Hall, and it's really a unique resource and workplace for students in the College of Arts and Letters. Room 305 is our brainstorming room, where we use whiteboards to write down our ideas, track our thoughts while we brainstorm, and we also have TVs if you need to show a presentation. Room 305 is really good for building ideas. 305 is where the big ideas start. Room 306 is our media lab and it comes equipped with seven desktop Macs. The Macs are fully loaded with uh, software like the Adobe Suite, um, Final Cut Pro, Camtasia. Students use 306 to work on a lot of media projects, so we get students making movies, we get students doing design work. Um, it's just kind of a all-encompassing project room. Room 307 is our conference room. Uh, people use it to work on projects they've already brainstormed to get feedback on presentations or ideas that they've come up with from other people. We have two huge whiteboards for people to um, take notes when people are talking, and we also have a bookcase full of books about graphic design, personal branding, and video editing, uh, among other things. The Fab Lab is located in our downstairs of Linton Hall, and it's a really great space to experiment with projects that you might have. So we have a lot of people um, down there using the laser cutter and they are making designs for a lot of art projects or also prototyping specific different tools like clips for your bike to mount an iPad or something like that.
and they do a range of different projects, working within a range of different media types, so there's different venues for creativity and innovation. And the activity I want to briefly share with you guys is a designing space competition activity that we do in class. And the scenario for students is that um, an anonymous donor has given them actually a good chunk of money, $14 million, to create a dynamic, innovative, creative space on campus for students. Um, the catch is the donor wants to hear from students about their design of the space and their uses of the space. Um, it'll be in our union, about 24 square feet, entirely raw space. So they have to work and collaborate in small groups um, to respond to this space design competition to show creativity, innovation, attention to space and space design. Um, some of the constraints, we talked earlier in the workshop about constraints. Uh, collaboratively prepared, representing different majors and ideas, present in the form of a standalone check, slideshow, group of visuals, some examples of the types of innovative work the space is designed to facilitate, and more. Um, and then I think, for me personally, this is my bias, creativity innovation is as much about project management as it is about good ideas. So we talk about some of the paths to getting started, uh, brainstorming and talking about the most interesting creative spaces that they've been in, Researching and reading about space design principles and how the design and layout of space, when deliberate, can be fuel for creativity and innovation. Um, looking for specific examples of exciting, engaging space design. Negotiating roles, who's going to manage the project. 40, 50 students all over the world in different time zones meeting online for the class. This project requires um, some innovation in project management, so different roles they might have, where they're going to work, how they're going to work. Um, and then an important note, I really don't want to hear them, this gets back to Carl's Venn diagram again. I don't want to hear them repeating some of the things that they've seen in the readings. I want to hear from them specifically about their creative and innovative ideas about the space and how we might use it. A second example of innovation, um, this is a longer term project that we're engaging in the Creativity Exploratory. We have an undergraduate student come in, um, and I'm assuming Florida has faced some of these similar issues over the years. Um, Michigan hemorrhages young people. Uh, we have tons of young people, born and raised in the state. We have great colleges and universities, and students go there, and they graduate from them, and they're gone. They're out of the state. Um, I used to be the advisor for all of our undergraduate students um, about eight years ago. I, I'd hear the same thing over and over again. Say, what do you want to do when you graduate? And where are you headed? Out of Michigan. That was the response. Not, you know, I want to do this in the world. I want to be this or even make this much money. Just, I want to get out of Michigan. So that started to change, but we're still having some significant issues as we move from um, uh, factory assembly lines sort of economy into a more creative different economy in the 21st century. So we had a student come in and say, I want to know what's driving Michigan. I want to know how people are being creative in the context of the state right now. And we thought, OK, you just came up with the entire brand for this project. So we have the Drive Michigan project right now. This is through the Creativity Exploratory. Um, and students get together. They ask questions. They research the state. Their core focus of inquiry is what's driving the creative economy in Michigan. And then once a month, we cram them into a van with a bunch of camera and audio recording equipment. And they go to a different city. And they interview people. How are you contributing to Michigan's creative economy? How are you driving the innovation of the state? Um, it has been an absolutely phenomenal project. And I can see we've been entirely, we throw money at them. And that's about it. The students entirely run and direct this project. Um, and we've been doing it now for about eight months. So we're starting to have some great footage. They built a website where they're reporting on this. Um, one of the other students who got involved early on was absolutely committed to not talking about community, but talking with the community and making sure that all of the spaces and places and people have access to all of the material. So they've created a huge database where people are pulling images, um, video, audio, and more. It's one of the most innovative, exciting projects I've been involved in in the last couple of years. So the digital, and I want to note here, so we've got creative, innovative, and digital. I'm not necessarily talking about digital humanities, but rather talking about the digital in a big, grand way, and the ways in which it's influencing all of the work that we do. I think it's absolutely important to the context of um, this and 
and what I'm building toward here. And <coughs> I, I will read through this. I will put this on a screen at any point in time that I can. This is part of um, the um, statement produced by MCCE and the National Writing Project to implement the National Dan Writing. This is actually a Senate approved uh, document. Whether we call it texting, I am mean, jotting a note, writing a letter, posting an email, blogging, making a video, building an electronic presentation, composing a memo, keeping a diary, or just pulling together a report. Americans are writing like never before. Recent research suggests that writing in its many forms has become a daily practice for millions of Americans. It may be the quintessential 21st century skill. And the inquiry project here is we need to understand who writes, when, how, to whom, and for what purposes across the different media and venues where writing communication is happening. So a couple of claims about this digital environment. Um, digital matters, and I don't think these are like whoa, groundbreaking surprises for any of us. Uh, digital matters in the ways in which writing is networked and visible and happens at a scale we've never before seen. Some of you might remember this interface. My space, you didn't have to admit it out loud. So back in the day, Tom had 268,806,800. A lot of friends, many friends, <laughs> many friends. So on Monday, July 27, 2009, Tom had, let me try it this time, 264,986,000. 7,947 friends on MySpace. Um, less than three months later, he had almost 4 million <laughs> new friends. But then, soon after, I think no recent updates. <laughs> <laughs> so, in just over three years, Tom lost 257 million. <laughs> That's gotta be a, a blow. <laughs> gotta be a blow. Meanwhile, however, um, MySpace has recently rebranded. Completely different digital visual interface functions um, because those millions of people are over on Facebook. Where there are more than 1.39 billion active users. Uh, more than 400 million photos are uploaded on average every day. 400 million. Oh. So if we can take the rest of the day to day talking about where those photos go and who they belong to and how they're circulating. Uh, more than 82% of users are outside of the United States. Um, WordPress has more than 74 million sites supported around the world. Users produce about 61 million new posts each month. More than 56 million comments monthly. And this was the last statistics I could find on uploads. They're from April 2014, it's almost a year ago, but we were looking at about 23 million files uploaded in that monthly period. This is the, this is the big data of the world today. This is the big writing space. Um, this is fascinating, we won't spend too much time here, but this is a live WordPress stat site, so it counts down the seconds we've been on this page, and this is what's happening on WordPress in real time. Participants to help the LLC get their heads around. 
um, what we might do with all this data. And they said, as society turns to social media as a primary method of communication and creative expression, social media is supplementing and in some cases supplanting letters, journals, serial publications, and other sources routinely collected by research libraries. Archiving and preserving outlets such as Twitter will enable future researchers access to a fuller picture of today's cultural norms, dialogue, trends, and events to inform scholarship, the legislative process, new works of authorship, education, and other purposes. So to these like this, can we not that? <laughs> Sometimes I get emotional over farms. I do too easily. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's claim one. Claim two are the collaborative aspects of the digital contacts, which I think are so um, important, often by necessity, often at grand scale, <laughs> so some of you might be uh, one of the hundreds of thousands of people uh, who spend their time uh, <laughs> labeling lolcat pics on the Icon has cheeseburger. It's a massive community of people. Um, if that doesn't horrify you enough, this should. A um, uh, community of people use um, a wiki to rewrite the Bible in lolcat posts. <laughs> oh hi, this is Genesis 1 verse 1. Oh hi, in the beginning Stanley Cat made the earth and the skies, but he did not eat them. The earth had no shape and had dark place. Stanley Cat wrote a visible life or visible wonders. The entire King James Bible. Um, and then there's this.
100 items related to Pride and Prejudice. Some of these are snippets, pieces, revisions of the characters. Some of these are full novellas. Um, Harry Potter currently holds uh, the title of the most popular. There are more than like 708,000 remixes of the Harry Potter characters and stories. A lot of writing happening and a lot of collaboration happening in just this one site. Um, and Doug mentioned this article. This is an article that Griffin listed a few years back that one of the arguments that we made in the piece, why teach digital writing, um, is that the publication, the distribution, and the types of collaboration that are happening in the digital space are transforming on a grand scale the ways in which we share knowledge, make knowledge, are creative, are innovative, and distribute our thoughts and ideas to the world. Um, and then a third claim, and that has to do with the shape of writing in network spaces and across these collaborative digital places. Um, so Flickr has changed its interface. Um, we used to get a count hit. So writing in October 2011 resulted more than 2.3 million photographs represented writing in a range of, of different ways. Now, um, of course, Flickr has kind of the endless scroll of hits. If we go over to um, Vine, Vine was acquired by Twitter in October 2012 for $30 million and allows people to share six second micro videos. Um, and the context of Vine and the ways in which we're seeing writing change shape, I think, so 2013 was the year that the number of mobile devices exceeded the world's total population. It is predicted, and I think I those claims suck right. It is predicted that, but we're looking at two-thirds of the world's data being video content by 2017. Writing communication are changing shape and changing shape fairly rapidly. Um, over 1.5 billion vines are played daily, so those six-second clips are kind of a lot of traction, a lot of movement in the world. <laughs> if we travel over to YouTube, um, we see that there are more than one billion users. They aren't quite hitting Facebook popularity, but close. One billion users per month. 300 hours of video are uploaded every minute to YouTube. That's where this video dominance really comes into play. Um, and YouTube reaches more, and I think this still frights advertisers and marketers uh, more young adults than any cable network. But we're still figuring out how to use these spaces as spaces for creativity, innovation, communication. Um, Katie was one of our students who was dual major, physics and professional writing. And the writing that she did and the communication that she did um, is something that we talk about now. She graduated a couple years ago. She graduated uh, and did an internship in DC with an educational think tank. Um, she left there for CERN, the European uh, Particle Physics Laboratory in Geneva. Her job title was science rapper. She wrote, <laughs> I will admit, horrible raps about uh, the, the Hadron Collider and more. Her large Hadron Rap has more than um, 7.5 million views. When we talk about audience and purpose of our writing and our communication, I think more recently, you saw Logan briefly um, in the PW video. Um, one of our students, he just graduated this past December, um, is a Marine vet, and his um, group, uh, the 2-5, suffered some of the most significant uh, deaths in Afghanistan. And he came back to produce a documentary um, with the surviving members. Um, and he is now traveling around the country sharing the documentary and talking about PTSD and, and trauma. Um, and his video, as of Monday morning, was at about 650,000 hits. So that's the digital context. I know I'm painting broad, broad strokes here. Um, but I want to wrap things up with the entrepreneurial and go back to that quick um, diagram that I showed. Uh, Seth Godin, if you're familiar with Seth Godin's work, um, he talks about what we need. We need, he always talks in grand universal scale, original thinkers, provocateurs, People who care. He calls these people artists, but I think you could also call these people entrepreneurs. Um, entrepreneurs are people with a genius for finding an answer, a new connection, a new way of getting things done. Um, and then Courtney Martin and Lisa Witter, I, I don't know, and would love to hear from you guys about what's going on around social and cultural entrepreneurship at your institution, but they, just, they argue strongly that we need better distinctions between the two. They describe social entrepreneurship as innovations focusing on changing markets and 
systems and disrupting of existing systems, alternative systems like microfinancing, and cultural entrepreneurship as innovations that change hearts and minds, that disrupt the weak. Um, so this is how we're configuring social and cultural intra and entrepreneurship. Um, this has been a battle near and dear to my heart over the past couple of months. Um, I'll mention, I'll show up a picture in a minute, but um, uh, the provost of our university brought a group of about 50 of us together back in May and said, um, things are bubbling up at Michigan State, but we need a coherent vision for entrepreneurship and we need to engage undergraduates in entrepreneurship better than we are right now. And we're a little bit behind. Um, so I took that back to my college and I said, this is our opportunity as a College of Arts and Letters um, to play a key role in this initiative and change how people think of entrepreneurship. Because, um, and I don't know if this is the case here, but in our College of Arts and Letters, people hear entrepreneurial, think, ooh, business, it's bad, it's, you know, it's, all, it's all marketing, it's all money, it's all glitz, it's not what we do in reality. And my argument is, we can do this work. This can align. Um, this, is, this is our wheelhouse, pursuing innovative solutions to social problems, creating tools and approaches to transform culture and create long-standing sustainable social value, sharing social messages through art and culture, innovating within organizations, and shaping new organizations to address wicked problems. And the wicked problems being those problems that cannot be addressed by one discipline, one type of thinking, one methodology, um, obesity, poverty, those are wicked problems we all have to get our heads around. Um, enhancing creative and cultural economies and measuring and assessing by reimagining social roles and new behavior. So the charge that we received with this, uh, we need to challenge the MSU community to engage at least 2,000 undergrads each year in entrepreneurship by the end of uh, uh, fiscal year 2016. So not quite counting numbers yet to get to that 2,000. But some of the actions that we've taken, we're rallying university resources. Um, we're launching the first ever university level minor. Um, that in itself, if you guys uh, serve in administrative roles, know the joy of working in, at that level. Um, we're developing e-options, options for students to pursue projects in the context of other classes. The classes might not have an entrepreneurial focus, but the student might bring that focus to the class and the project. We're establishing um, entrepreneurial advisors in each college, people who can best help students from the College of Arts and Letters, uh, the College of Social Sciences, the College of Engineering to navigate entrepreneurial opportunities. We're launching an e-core to make sure that we have a strong community connection, and we're engaging in act active projects, creating a community industry advisory board, connecting with K-12 stakeholders, we think that's absolutely crucial, um, and our goal is to offer a multitude of extracurricular and co-curricular activities. So this is a group of us locked ourselves in a room for three weeks over the summer and worked on a, a white paper and a set of goals. We're in the midst of, of um, acting on this now. Um, but and meanwhile, our students are doing this already. Um, Kalia is an apparel and textile design student. This is not one of the designs for this project, I have to say. This is just <laughs> a design that's gorgeous and she's proud of. Um, but she's working to develop a, a clothing line. She's working with people in the community and employers and students um, from women transitioning between being students and being professionals, which is an incredible professional and economic burden for students. So again, this is not one of those outfits, but that's what she's working on. Um, we have two students who are working with the MSU Usability and Accessibility Research and Consulting Lab um, to raise awareness about web accessibility. I think we're in a moment right now at our institution, I would suspect you guys are too, where web accessibility is kind of hitting a crescendo. We're building more and more MOOCs and online classes, um, and we're doing some rapid development that isn't perhaps attending to usability and accessibility the way it needs to. Um, I know a lot of instructors who build online videos for their courses, for instance, without captioning or alternative methods to get the information. So these two students are working to consult with teachers and with departments to make sure that the materials that they produce are robust, accessible, and usable. Um, in the Creativity Exploratory, the Innovation Lab I mentioned earlier, we have a Pathways to Entrepreneurship program where College of Arts and Letters students can come in with an idea, and it can be based on cultural and social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in startups, or entrepreneurship in organizations. 
organization. And we help them, um, we provide seed funding for them to establish and move their projects along. Um, but we can't and we will not be the, the be all for the institution for entrepreneurship. That's not our wheelhouse, that's what, that's not what we can do. But what we've been doing uh, pretty deliberately is connecting with other institutions on and around campus. The Hatch is part of our Spartan Innovations in East Lansing. They have millions of dollars of funding and they exist to facilitate student ideas. They have a lawyer on staff. Um, they have someone who's a specialist in developing organizations, whether that be new corporations or 503Cs, nonprofit organizations. They have graphic designers, they have web developers. So we're able to cultivate the student ideas and get them prepared to move into this next phase of their social or cultural entrepreneurial project. Right. Did I bring all of this to the So this is a conversation I've been having pretty regularly um, with the associate dean and the dean of our college. Um, I think there are multiple roles that the humanities can play uh, in today's world and in the context of this creative, innovative, digital, and entrepreneurial directions. Um, we can do what we've always done well, right? This is, this is what we do. Uh, equip students to be critical thinkers who are attentive to cultural and historical dynamics in which they're working. Um, we, we have an arts and culture emphasis and orientation, um, and I think we have a strong skill set in terms of creativity, especially creative arts. I think there's this whole realm of, I call them other, because this is the battle I've been fighting in Michigan City, these other things that we can do. Because this is, this is great, but I don't know about your institution, this isn't gonna get us the money, the funding, and the support that we need We've already been doing this. We'll just keep doing it. That, mm, that's not a great thing to say. I think we have a huge role to play in social and cultural entrepreneurship, uh, citizen engagement, community activism, uh, rhetoric and circulation, arts and cultural management, um, nonprofit communication, user experience and experience architecture. These are the contributions that humanities can have in the larger landscape of these initiatives, financial pressures, and historical changes that are happening. To bring it back to this. So if you um, read in academic administration, um, in professional development, the T-shaped professional has been a hot topic for a while now. Um, Tom Kelly, the CEO of IDO, a creativity think tank with international reputation, um, originally launched the idea of the T-shaped professional. So it's not enough to have an I-shaped professional. The I shape is the argument that someone has really strong depth in a particular disciplinary area. That's fine, that's good, that's, that's how we've trained people for quite some time. Um, but that's the I shape the individual. What we also need is this cap here, this horizontal cap, and that's breadth. Those are the skills that transcend our disciplinary orientations. Uh, critical thinking, problem solving abilities, creative capacity, the ability to collaborate, and more. Um, but what I think is in the middle here, which I think serves as the glue between this vertical and horizontal axis, um, is this creativity, innovation, attention to the digital and entrepreneurship. Um, and I think we have to work more toward the humanities, um, engaging students in leadership capacity, um, strategizing innovative and entrepreneurial abilities, um, engaging students in a willingness, we talked about this a little bit in the workshop, to take calculated risks and understand risk taking and play and experimentation as part of what we do. Um, and then the ability to pitch projects and manage projects on a pretty grand scale. So I think that's the glue that holds these the two things together. And I wanted to bring this back to the students. So these are some of the students I've had the privilege of working with for the past couple years, primarily in the context of the Creativity Exploratory. But these are the students who are already, I think, ahead of us in doing this. They're doing it. Um, Josh said, I had a unique and invaluable experience. I was tasked with crafting the architecture and usability testing and projects with real applications, not hypothetical class projects, while well, simultaneously working on the front end development of the projects. There aren't many really places, really anywhere, that afford students the opportunity to work in the two such intimately related but conventionally separate arenas. And he's now um, a user experience designer with a company called Tiny Couch in Brooklyn. Cassie, who said, this is an amazing place to work and think, amazing people to help and inspire. I got to work on fully loaded equipment, go to events and workshops, learn how to communicate with a wider group of people. In the creativity, 
exploratory work on projects with other designers, web programmers, user experience designers, professional writing students, and faculty. The interaction of the pair of you with both the junior and senior designers, design and creative directors, copywriters, account executives, and coordinators where I work now. And she's a graphic designer. And then Dan, and Dan was, this is what happens when you email students, you're like, hey, I need a picture for a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> My fault, perhaps, for not providing more content. <laughs> um, but Dan was one of the students who was involved with the Jamming um, for Japan initiative, who was one of the three in that initial picture that I shared. Um, Dan, the user experience designer at Razorfish in Chicago, and he talked about specifically the creativity exploratory in the College of Arts and Letters as a chance to explore some of the activities about which I was unsure, both in my own natural ability and my interests. If it weren't for this space, I'd likely never have created several videos that have been published in major venues. This space embodies the type of thinking not only bring MSU, but higher education as a whole forward in society. Um, and I think Dan does a really good job of talking about the importance of the cultural, the innovative, the digital, and the entrepreneurial, and how we can cultivate these T-shaped professionals who have the depth and the breadth, the disciplinary experience, the broad set of skills, and then that connection point of the cultural, um, the entrepreneurial, the innovative. That was a lot, and it was a lot quickly. <laughs> and I know we're close to out of time, but let me just talk through these two handouts. So one handout you have um, with the two URLs at the top, I posted this slideshow online, and for whatever reason you want it, feel free to grab stuff you stuff, remix stuff. It's posted online as a PDF. Um, and I've also posted a handful of readings. These are primarily um, on creativity and innovation. They're uh, posted in, online in a zip folder. And then the second handout is um, just a bibliography of some key pieces that work across these four areas. And if you're interested in reading around the T-shaped, uh, the idea of the T-shaped professional, there's a couple of specifically T-shaped um, readings listed there too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. I usually get to go and talk about my research, and this was more about my administrative life right now. An interesting experiment for me. Do you have some questions? Yeah. Are you yeah. familiar with Launchpad? Are you familiar with Launchpad at all? I know the name. I'm wondering if it's like Hatch. I, I was, it's just a random question. Is I, it a I, national? I'm not sure. I'm working with a student right now doing a very similar project with design um, yeah. on, li on literacy, race, um, and then fashion. And we're working with Launchpad. And I was curious if it was like Hatch, so maybe we could have a conversation later, but I don't know. Let's have a conversation later for sure. Um, I think part of the, this work is, uh, I think the immediate reaction that I've been getting to from, from some of my colleagues is, I don't do this. These are my circles. Um, it's, it's strategically constellating the ideas and then the resource and support services too, so you can be good by students to say, go see this person. Mm -hmm. Go talk to this. Let's put these things together. Here's what you can take from what we're doing and where you might need to go next. It's extremely cool stuff, everything you're presenting. Um, and uh, my struggle when I'm teaching is often, um, I, I, I'm on a read it, I read it, read it, I guess. Yeah. And I want my students to read it in the discipline yeah. that they're learning about, but then I find that there's not enough time for them to do the rest of the creative work that I want them to do. And I try and have them do it at the same time, but they're doing stuff that they're then understanding four weeks later. Yeah. So I don't know how you manage, or do you manage that? Do you just cut the readings way down? <laughs> that is such a good question, right? We were talking earlier in the workshop about how big a container our classes can be, yeah. and what all we need. Um, and boy, I don't have the answer for that. I don't know if others do. But I'm wondering if there would be a way to configure a set of outcomes, and then to integrate the readings and the activity in a way like I'm wondering, this is a kind of a, a not really an anchored um, example, but I'm thinking about potentially like using Google Docs as a space um, to get students thinking through and talking through some of the key concepts in the readings and then taking that elsewhere. So um, I just observed a class like two weeks ago of um, a faculty I work with, and he calls it the giant Google Doc. And every day he starts class with a series of prompts and has students respond to the prompts in the Google Doc. So you have 20 people crowdsourcing reading notes for the class, contributing at once, and watching this on the screen, and then him facilitating them talking through the readings and the key concepts. And 15 minutes later, they're moving up to enacting those concepts through an activity. 
like. Yeah, I think like I just started using bibliographies in my classes and assigning bibliographies to particular students yeah. to sort of because there's too much reading. Yeah. Yeah. Then I was also thinking um, there's the problem of uneven expertise where like as the teacher your, your expertise might be just so much higher than your students and whatever pieces they're working on if they bring them to you you still have just some capacity that, that they don't quite have to see the big picture. Yeah. Um, so how do you you want to empower them but at the same time you don't want to say like, you know, that's wrong, that's wrong. Yeah, right. How do you do that? Oh jeez, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean I wish I had a great answer for that. Um, I would go on the road as an educational consultant <laughs> if I had a good answer for that. But I mean that's part of this digital context, right? I think it is. It, it has to be because of the information capacity that we have right now. Um, and I think in the humanities, if we continue to teach students to approach reading the way we love and linger over reading, I, I don't think it's gonna work in today's context. I mean we have to be teaching different strategies of reading. This is some stuff so crucial. Something I implemented in my um, freshman comp course is just collaborative reading. So like, there's collaborative PDF editors out there. And so they can, see, like I assign each one a color, and they highlight in that color each student in groups of like four or five, and then they write notes in the margin and respond back and forth in the margins. So they already start understanding like what to look for with each other in the readings and figuring out, you know, or they can pose a question like, I didn't understand this reading at all, and start discussing before they even get to class. But I thought that was an interesting way that I was using like a collaborative online source in order for us to understand how like reading itself is socially constructed yeah. and socially um, mediated. It is, and it, I guess one of the things I keep facing is there's so many hurdles. Like, um, like unless they learn rhetoric really well, they can't tell when an author is making a case that's. Um, they're making a counter case okay. that they're then going to oppose and maybe, you know, like reversing the opposing case and then students can't often tell that that's not actually what the author believes. <laughs> and then it's, it's like, really, I've had whole classes of students where nobody can get up that the author is not agreeing with this but making an opposing case. And she's going, wow, how good is that? Yeah. But I, I wonder if that's what they have to be encountering that in our everyday lives. I mean, that's a blog strategy and a trolling tactic and a, you know, throwing the other argument out to see who bites and, like, they're seeing it, but are, are we not able to then, you know, move that over into a different place and a different style of writing and different engagement? Doug, what do you think? I, th I think that, <coughs> I, think, I think that I really identify with that problem. And it's certainly something when we were doing when we, when we were doing access and social justice, like the same issue, like where you're dealing with a really dense or very complicated, because there's a lot on the line, critical theory, you know, having, uh, here's an introduction to post-colonial theory because that's where oppression comes from, and, you know, and, and moving really forward. And I think one of the things that really helped was to make the reading and what the reading mattered materially and the creation of things or matter in the performance, um, in the research performance moment that um, maybe maybe doesn't give the breath that you're talking about, but certainly when the things and the complexities that you're talking about are things and complexities you have to deal with when encountering others and then building for others. And I mean, like basic building like documents, but also like wireframes. Um, that's one of the, because I think that is a really important problem. In, in a grad seminar I taught last semester uh, with the more dense, complicated, theoretically oriented readings, um, what we often did is their reading response rather than an individual single author piece directly to me about what they're taking from the reading, is um, we built a slideshow and Google presentation and everyone took a slide and pulled a concept and had to 
Oh, but we use like a, a frame for each one. It's like explain, connect, expand. So explain it, connect it to what else we've been doing in the class, and then expand it toward what does this mean for you? What can you do with this? Um, so by the time class started, because they, they were expected to do this between classes, when class started the next week, we had this rich set of information to go through and we could talk about, you know, did they hit all the key points? Are we finding ways of connectivity? Are we thinking about this in a more cohesive way? And that seemed to work pretty well and it was manageable in the context of the class when there's so much work to do right. to shape the reading responses around something like that. Um, yeah, and it reminds me of two of those things. Um, sometimes I remember to this, but everything uh, that's been written or done uh, as text is some sort of problem solving. Yes. I mean, so so bring it back to that, you know, if you're reading both by the rules, it's, it's an attempt to address a problem. What was the problem? Why was this set of tools yeah. and strategies used and so on? Uh, and the same thing if they're looking at painting or anything else. It's a, I don't know, I, I'm big on time here. Yeah. Theory, so. Well, and it's a modeling of inquiry, methods, methodology, theory, the types of things that for PhD candidates, they have to be doing in their work and rather than in practice and in their teaching. Yeah. I'm curious about the transformative impact these projects have had on your campus. Have you start, is the provost now throwing money at you or have you seen <laughs> students who are saying, I've learned so much more now about literacy? That's the next phase. And I, I wish I had more. I mean, I have this, we've done, like, for the Creative the Exploratory, we've been around since fall of 2011. So those two stories that I told, the jamming for Japan and the, the ability for students to rally around and produce something in the world that quickly, and then that technology survey we were doing, that directly led to us, led us to launching the Creativity Exploratory that fall. And saying, all right, students are doing this, we need to be a better host at home for them to do these projects. Just because there are moments we need to step out of the way and just let them go. Um, so there is that. So we do have some data on the creativity exploratory. Most of it is qualitative. It's interviews with people like Dan and Cassie um, and Josh, the students I shared at the end. The next phase, the big phase, um, that lends itself better, I think, to larger scale assessment is going to be the university level minor. Um, and the large scale engagement of students being able to track people coming out of the minor and follow them as to what they do next and what they're able to do with the minor. So the minor lends itself well, and there are good models for evaluating co-curriculars that we're going to have to be implementing too. Um, but we're behind. I mean, we really are. I mean, it was just this past May that the purpose was like, you guys, come on. There's stuff bubbling up, but there's no unified, coherent sense of this is entrepreneurship at Michigan State University. So we're, I mean, we're early on in this process. In some ways, I think established a great framework or skeleton for the work that comes next, but a key part of it is going to be the assessment. What are the real outcomes of this sort of stuff? I have a question about the T-shaped student. Yeah. My provost likes the sunset too. Yeah. Um, right? It's sexy. I haven't yeah. had a provost yet. It like, yeah, Sometimes yeah. it's talked about in terms of an educational process where the general education program teaches the depth and then it or the breadth and then it goes into the depth and that can be a little limiting and so yeah. what struck me about what you were saying the examples you gave was how you integrative learning is crucial all the way through your programs and that the way even the way you're trying to position your college is more than just kind of the breadth provider but also the depth provider i'm just trying to get a way to talk about that because almost it's almost when i was thinking about what you were doing, I was almost imagining the top of the T, the side thing being sort of the mechanism that allows the top of the T to move all the way down. And yeah, almost like name. a... But if you think about the process the students go through, that's kind of what you're doing. I mean, you're using those cross-cutting skills all the way through to learn the disciplinary knowledge, to connect it to real-world applications. I just think it's really important. I don't think we're doing a service to students if we, if we set, do that sort of separation. Yeah. So this is the gen ed, this is your major. Uh, it ruptures, I think, the very philosophy and beliefs underneath this notion of breadth and depth in really artificial ways. But that's an easier way to do it, right? Okay, you guys do this to the top of it. Yeah. You guys do that, we're good. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. I wanted to tell you about this class that I'm taking right now. It's an elective for me. 
and it's in another college, but it's um, a philanthropy and social entrepreneurship class. So I've read some of the um, things that you have listed yeah. here. And I think it's a really interesting concept that I haven't seen um, really applied um, in the university, but I think there's a lot of potential there. But what we're doing in the class is we're actually partnering, partnering with the Community Foundation. And so they brought in board members to um, work with us. And then we go through the um, profiles of the nonprofits in the community yeah. and look for social entrepreneurship opportunities and kind of evaluate them. And then we also have um, funds um, from the foundation that we are able to work with teams to um, kind of identify nonprofits, what they're doing right, what they could do better. Yeah. And uh, we actually get to um, make recommendations. We're going to present to the board our final recommendations for who they should um, support. That's exciting. And I'm really enjoying the class. And um, I, it's very much, it's very, it's heavily, um, it's like a service learning type class. And, um, and we don't always do that as students. Um, so I think that I like what you were talking about. And I think that the more learning experience and then people to think of more like um, entrepreneurial and crowdsourcing, crowdfunding um, and I think ways. We're at a moment. This is where I engage in hyperbole, mm -hmm. but I really appreciate it. We're at a moment where I think the humanities has so much to contribute to these administrative discussions, to discussions that are happening in other colleges, to really anchor the value of what we do. All of this is a humanistic endeavor and our values are at the core. Mm -hmm. Um, my fear, to kind of put things in a dark perspective, is if we don't take a leadership role in the creative, the innovative, the digital, the entrepreneur, especially in the social and cultural entrepreneurship, um, it will always be the business school that does that stuff. Or, you know, it happens over there, but it doesn't happen here. And it does I could happen. also see in this class, like, how they could um, benefit from some of the thinking that I've learned in this college, because they're talking about philanthropy and, you know, voluntary action for the social good, but they don't really question what the social good is. Yes. And I think that that's where humanities can really um, influence and make those other colleges better. Absolutely. I've never been in a meeting where someone who wasn't a humanist said something like, but what is community? Mm -hmm. Who are we talking about when we say community? What do we mean by social good or social will or social capital? I think those are important questions that we're really well equipped, mm -hmm. not only to raise, but to engage students in helping us answer. Mm -hmm. And to reflect on what's going on. Very much so. All right, guys, I think we're over time. People have to teach and go to class yeah. and such, but um, we're going to stick around for a few minutes if there are other questions, and I think we'll come to score and see a weather plan. So, how about another round of applause? Yeah. <laughs>